make us a holy people, a special people, in contrast to the other nations. But if the other nations didn't exist, we wouldn't need for this. Uh, then he says, this may be compared with the holiness of the priestly tribe, that is the colony. The colony, it's the election from all the tribes of Israel for especially sacred service is the reason for their respective priestly laws. We have all the laws about the colony because they're separate. But if no special tribe had been chosen, that is, if every tribe could do the, then there would be no priestly law. Okay, I'm kind of curious how Sean Hannity is going to cover the day's events. And welcome to Hannity. And we begin tonight with a Fox News alert. Wow, what a day in the Washington sewer and swamp once again. While you, the American people, you know, the people that actually make this a great country are facing, you know, a deluge of serious problems, you know, like record inflation, record high gas prices, record numbers of illegal immigrants, record homicides in so many of our towns and cities. Well, the swamp creatures on Capitol Hill, they were busy with yet another anti-Trump kangaroo court and show trial where the outcome, as we've been telling you, has been and remains predetermined. It's been that way since day one. Instead of honest hearings on how to protect our institutions, our elected officials, to protect the people's house, the Capitol, instead of ever allowing riots like those that occurred in the summer of 2020 from ever, ever happening again, we see nothing but blind, never-ending rage, uh, what is a seemingly an obsessive, compulsive cult-like rage against Donald Trump. Never ends. Now, clearly, Trump haters, for them, January 6th is just another excuse to smear Donald Trump, anyone who supports them. This is not about safety and security and securing the Capitol or getting to the truth. This has never been about having a fair and serious hearing and proceeding so we can come up with solutions. Today, we heard more rumors, a ton of hearsay, and wow, a lot of impeached uh, testimony that we'll get to in a second. And this is why it's never, hearsay is never admissible in a real court of law, including this wild claim from a former low-level White House staffer. Watch this. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Engel. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motion towards his clavicles. What you heard there is an incredibly bizarre hearsay allegation from a person who, according to our sources, was was actually prepared. She wanted to work for Donald Trump outside the White House when he wasn't president at Mar-a-Lago. And according to people that I talked to tonight until others advised the former president not to hire her. In other words, according to the Federalist and people I spoke to after January the 6th, she wanted to work for Donald Trump, that bad person she's now testifying against. And now get this, according to NBC, by the way, ABC is reporting it, Fox News is reporting it, reporting it NBC's Peter Alexander, we have confirmed it here at Fox, quote, a source close to the Secret Service is telling me both Bobby Angle, the lead agent, and the presidential limousine driver are both prepared to testify under oath, under the threat of perjury, that neither man was ever assaulted uh, and that Mr. Trump, then president, never lunged for the steering wheel. A perfect example of why hearsay is not allowed in a real court of law. Today, the so-called witness also claimed President Trump wanted to get rid of the metal detectors at the January 6th rally and allow armed individuals to attend. Today, President Trump flat out denied this claim and pointed out a simple fact. Zero guns were ever discharged by those that breached the Capitol or in D.C. that day. According to so many so-called journalists in the media mob, it was hyperventilating. Again, oh, we, we got him again this time. Trump, Russia, collusion. Oh, we got him. Let's impeach him. Anyway, they said this was a game changer. Wrong again.
Oh, the January 6th Select Committee wrapped up a stunning public hearing. It was, we should make no mistake, one for the history books and a complete game changer. Only 25 or 26 years old, Cassidy Hutchinson exploded the lies and the myths that the Trump team have been perpetuating for more than a year now. This is an historic day. Our descendants are going to ask us what we know about Cassidy Hutchinson. That's a name that they will know. They're going to ask it, uh, us what this was like to watch this and to listen to this because this is a day that is going to loom very large in American history. One last thing, big picture. Liz Cheney began her final comments by saying that we are in debt to Cassidy Hutchinson. I think America and democracy is in debt to this young woman. Oh, really? Just take her word for it. She wasn't even there. Hearsay witness. Sound familiar? Oh, that was the other impeachment trial. Now, amid all... It's not just America. It's not just democracy that that's in debt to this marvelous young woman. All right? The entire universe should be bowing down to Cassidy Hutchinson. The sun, moon, and stars should be bowing down to Cassidy Hutchinson. All the angels and devils should be bowing down to Cassidy Hutchinson, right? The, the orbit of the, the sun, moon, and stars should, should change to spell out her name, Cassidy Hutchinson, right? It's just, it's a real game changer, total game changer. <laughs> oh, man, I love this book, Mind, Modernity, and Madness. The impact of culture on human experience, because it rings really true to me. When I've had the most freedom and the most choice, I've been the most likely to go unhinged. And when I developed an identity, and the stronger the identity I developed, then the more mentally stable I, I grew. So. This is Leah Greenfeld. She talks about the unrivaled importance of love in modern life. And it's true. It's it's like the it's like the the ultimate value, right? Is love. And, and I think a lot of this has to do we are in an English speaking Christian society, or one that's at least shaped by English speaking Christians. So love is a huge word in English speaking Christianity. And if we were in Israel, a Jewish state, all right, love is not the the number one value. But uh, we've got love delivering sex in a whole new package, right? Love and sex, they, they now get to suffuse our life with meaning that was rendered meaningless by the withdrawal of God, and by the bewildering openness of social structures so that you didn't know where to turn simply, you know, who am I? How should I then live? Bewildering. Well, love will shine the light. So, as the, the English approach to life with its veneration of nationalism, with the competitiveness that comes with nationalism, with the, the growing dignity of every individual, and with the valorization of love, right, all modern societies accepted love as a passion, as the authentic and the sovereign expression of human nature. But only certain societies stressed love's freedom from convention and therefore the freedom of the self, and this primarily Anglo societies. So for the French, love was an essentially a sexual concept and was particularly a man's passion that just takes him over. Now, traditionally, marriage is best, is best made in a dispassionate way, right? In, in traditional societies, marriage is made pragmatically. It's a bourgeois institution, it is rational, it is strictly organized, and it is obedient to social conventions. So one of the fundamental fundamentals of Western civilizations is the rejection of the idea of luck. So luck is understood in Christianity as felicity, as you know, a divine spark, but luck obviously can be good or bad, it's unpredictable. But happiness is purely good, and it can be pursued. Great news, guys. So faith is a gift to which none are entitled. But 
but uh, ambition is a natural and inalienable right, the ambition to be happy. So happiness as developed in the 16th century in England and then suffusing the modern world really has nothing in common with the phenomena of happiness prior to the 16th century. So people obviously prior to the 16th century knew joy and they knew pleasure. But now happiness is the ultimate end of life. This is new, starting with late 16th century England and transferring over to the Declaration of Independence and the American approach to life, where it's all about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of love. Right? This is our reason for being. Right? This gives us a firm and satisfactory identity. Happiness became the whole purpose of existence. So in an increasingly open, increasingly secular society where you are free to construct your own identity, the bed you sleep in is the bed you make. So good luck can help and bad luck might interfere with your plans. But in the final analysis, you are the architect of your own happiness. So you are supposed to choose and then build your own life. So this places tremendous responsibility squarely on your shoulders. But the rewards that you can reap from that are more than worth it, right? So happiness is supposed to be a lasting joy. It's not just some vaguely vague pleasure, right? We were supposed to become artists and paint our life. We we're supposed to construct our identity. We're supposed to have self-definition, self-expression, self-realization, follow our passions for, for ambition and for love to express ourselves, to discover ourselves, to realize our authentic and sovereign self. So the 16th century in England gave us the first century of the world as we know it now. It gave us a whole new understanding of love, ambition, happiness, the dignity of man. And it also gave us madness. Right? With the explosion of freedom came an explosion in madness. So Perhaps the most striking aspect of literary England in the second half of the 18th century is how many of its best writers became insane. Right? You've heard a lot about the madness of poets, but this really refers to the madness of English language poets. Right? Poets writing in English have tended to go mad. So this remarkable madness has become a badge of the profession. But it's not equally true for poets in other languages. So many psychiatrists say, oh, this madness, this is a manic depressive illness. It's just another expression of, of genes responsible for extraordinary creativity. It's just too much of, of a good thing. But uh, the answer, says Leo Greenfeld, is the opposite, right? People are writing so passionately because they are mad, because they are so desperate about their lack of identity. So the writing and the poetry is a symptom and an expression of the madness. It's a desperate I am, right? Poets are always talking about who they are. So in the mid-17th century, there was a Frenchman who lived in England for seven years, and he noticed that English farmers were materially far better off than French farmers. But in the midst of this plenty, the farmer is not so happy here as in France. He may be richer, but not happier. So the English of all ranks have a melancholy air. It's part of their national character. The farmers here show very little happiness even when they're drunk. Whereas in France, the farmers in several provinces drink nothing but water and yet are as gay as possible. So this is a comment made 40 years before the French Revolution. So from the French point of view, this cheerfulness, which is characteristic of our nation, which seems to the English folly, but is their gloominess really a mark of greater wisdom? If our gaiety makes them sad, they ought not to find it strange if their seriousness makes us laugh. Similarly, he says, had the Jewish people not been chosen for amongst all other nations, had all of mankind been called for the purpose to which Israel alone was called, there would be no special ceremonial law. But rather, would be a, there, there would be a law for all mankind, a simple, pure, moral law. Okay, so that's his starting point. Then he says, only because so many nations, indeed all men, were so little developed, 
And because Israel, in accordance with the promise made to our forefathers, had alone been called a holy people, was a ceremonial law necessary. For it was not sufficient for Israel to be given a moral law consisting of pure faith and true conceptions of the one true God. It had to receive the ceremonial law in the whole context of other peoples and Israel's relation to them. That is, because of the situation that ancient Israel was in, it needed the ceremonial law to affirm their uniqueness, their separateness, their holiness. Oh, let's go back to Sean but The so-called spy chief of China tells his son that he thinks he's in the clear. Listen to this. Hey, pals, Dad. It's 8.15 um, on uh, Wednesday night. If you get a chance, give me a call. Not, nothing urgent. Just want to talk to you. I thought the article, at least the thing on online, is going to be printed tomorrow in the Times, was good. I think it's clear. And uh, anyway, um, if you get a chance, give me a call. I love you. All right, that was 2018. He's running for president in 2020, and he was asked over and over again and repeated over and over again that he never one time, not once, ever spoke to Hunter Biden about his foreign business dealings at all. You might remember. We have the tape. Take a look. Mr. Vice President, how many times have you ever spoken to your son about his overseas business dealings? I've never spoken to my son about his overseas business dealings. I have never discussed with my son or my brother or anyone else anything having to do with their businesses, period. And what I will do... Okay, here's just a brief clip from Donald Trump rally on Saturday. President Trump, on behalf of all the MAGA patriots in America, I want to thank you for the historic victory for white life in the Supreme Court yesterday. <laughs> I think she meant right to life. Sorry, victory for white life. <laughs> Gosh, disavow. Do is the same thing we did in our administration. There will be an absolute wall between personal and private uh, and, and, and the government. Do you stand by your statement that you did not discuss any of your son's overseas business yes, dealings? Yes, I stand by that statement. Now, we even have pictures of Joe and Hunter and all those foreign business partners. Joe met them. Where's that investigation? Joe Biden was straight up lying to our faces. He did it over and over and over again. And it's clear from Hunter's laptop from hell that Joe profited. And why, by the way, is this why Joe doesn't want to lift tariffs on China? Because they have him compromised? Hunter made a fortune? Is this why Joe Biden approved Vladimir Putin's Nord Stream 2 pipeline while simultaneously canceling the Keystone XL pipeline uh, because Hunter made a fortune from a Russian oligarch? Uh, the media mob, the Democratic Party, they don't care at one bit. In fact, they don't care really about the corruption, the lying, the dishonesty, or real quid pro quos, or the violence in the summer of 2020, because they can't use it to bash their political opponents. It's that simple. Have you ever asked yourself why there's never been a committee to investigate all of those peaceful riots, 500 and what, 74 of them in the summer of 2020, dozens of dead Americans, thousands of injured police officers, billions in property damage. Uh, where, where's that committee? A federal courthouse attacked every single night for months in Portland. A police precinct in Minnesota burned to the ground. Historic St. John's Church next to the White House lit ablaze. They don't seem to care about any of it. Why? Because it doesn't help them politically. They can't use it to bash Donald Trump one more time for good old fun. The media, D.C. politicians, were either silent about those riots or didn't want to anger their left-wing radical base. So they either were silent or they lied to us and said they were mostly peaceful and we know they weren't, or they just outright encouraged it like Kamala Harris. Okay, so when I was most free, that's when I was most likely to be mad, bad, and dangerous to know. But when I started living a life that was integrated with other people, right? Vouch nationalism, where people would vouch for me, I would vouch for them, we'd vouch for each other, we'd look, look after each other, we'd have obligations to each other. Right, vouch nationalism, then I became a lot happier. So when we get clarity comes happiness. When we develop a positive relationship with reality, right, we, we get happiness. It wasn't enough just to have the moral law. And then he continues, should all other nations perish from the face of the earth because of a flood and Israel alone remain, 
or should the rest of mankind accept the so in reform judaism as opposed to traditional judaism there's a lot more freedom right so i i wonder if there's a lot more mental illness in reform judaism or in secular jewish life compared to traditional jewish life where there's much less freedom the more traditional you go in jewish life the less freedom faith of the patriarchs and be converted to pure monotheism in that very moment, the ceremonial law would cease to have binding force for Israel also. Uh, what do your friends do for you? Okay, so I was bitten by a stingray a month ago. And when I was able to like talk about that pain with someone who gave a damn, it seemed to reduce the intensity of the pain. All right, that, that's what friends do, do for you. When something goes good for me and I want to celebrate it, it's so much more meaningful when I, I can talk about it with a friend. So I could go to the most beautiful places on earth. I could go to Sydney, the Sydney Harbor. I could go to Yosemite. I could go to Big Sur. But unless there are people that I can share that experience with, it doesn't have the same resonance. So if I succeed in something and there's no one that I can share it with, if I'm socially isolated, then it just doesn't have the same emotional valence, bro. But when you have friends, the pain is reduced. And when you have friends, the, the joy is significantly increased. So for me, you can, you can essentially tell the level of my friendships and my social connections by how much energy and joy and happiness I bring to the show. Like when I'm connected with other people, when I'm integrated into the lives of other people, I will come do this show with energy, passion, enthusiasm, joy, happiness, like, yeah. But when it, you, you spot me dragging, if you spot me lagging, if you spot me sad and, and depressed and, and moping and edging into my martyr's complex, which is a virus that, that I carry around with me and can, can come out at, at any time, then I'm, I'm disconnected. But the prospect of seeing friends or coming coming away from, from spending time with friends, it just, it just fills me up. I, I see so many more possibilities in life, right? So many more options that I, I wasn't thinking about where for investing money or you know, new things to do or more effective ways to, to do things. I mean, we all walk around you know, with blind spots. I remember I was driving north on on the Pacific Coast Highway and I pulled into the left lane to pass a car and then I just stayed in the left lane and I was in the un in oncoming traffic lane. I didn't even realize it, but luckily my girlfriend like tapped the dashboards to say, you need to move over. And so that could have killed me. That absolutely could have killed me. I remember I came back from Australia in 1982, so I was 16. And I was driving down the street with my mother. She was driving and I felt something was off, but I didn't have the confidence of my perceptions to say anything. She was driving in the wrong lane. Like she was driving in, front, in the lane where there's incoming traffic. And so eventually someone starts heading towards her and she stops and pulls over and he inquires if she's drunk and, and she says, no, I'm just back from Australia. But uh, if we'd had a third person in the car, right, that would have been much less likely to happen so i remember i was i was with a friend and she she was insisting that other people go along with what she wanted and i was able to say to this friend no you need to respect the the choices of these other people you can't impose on them you can ask them once but then you need to stop i said stop and and she listened to me and similarly when negotiating with, with bureaucracy or negotiating with, uh, you know, difficult situations, you know, my, my friend had, had a lot more wisdom. So we would help each other. There are certain situations where I would take charge because my friend's kind of overwhelming desire to, to change people and to, you know, force them to do what she wanted was not serving her, was not serving other people. And my more passive approach would work better. And so I came out of my passivity to, to insist on, on giving other people room, room to breathe. Other times my more passive approach was not as effective and needed the more dynamic approach of my friend. And then I allowed her to lead out because 
I, I needed that. I mean, I, I converted to Orthodox Judaism, but most of what I've learned about Orthodox Judaism, I, I didn't learn in books, right? There are all these social structures, these rhythms, these codes for behavior that are not written down in, in books. And so I would learn the backstories of people that I was dovening with, right? I, I, I would learn about what was really going on in certain interactions that I was seeing, but not really understanding. Like I, I was learning the unwritten rules. You succeed in a job space, not primarily based on your understanding of the, of the employee handbook that, that you may be given, but you generally succeed because you connect with other people and you learn the unwritten rules from, from other people. Do your friends pick you up after a colonoscopy? Yes, your friends can pick you up. Now, I don't know, is it necessary to be picked up after a colonoscopy? But I've known a lot of people who didn't have someone to take them to the hospital or to pick them up from the hospital. I went in because I broke my wrist and I walked two and a half miles to a hospital in Century City and then they didn't want to release me, right? They kept me in overnight because I didn't have someone to pick me up and they only very reluctantly release me around noon the next day to a taxi, I didn't have someone to, to pick me up. And I was so bereft, I was so lonely that I ran into a gypsy while waiting in line for pain medication that I never ended up taking. And so I ended up dropping $900 on this gypsy to tell my fortune because I was feeling so alone in the world. This is April of 1998. Yeah, hospitals don't want to let you out unless you got a ride. So I remember I went in for turbinate reduction surgery, and my friend Rabbi Rabs, who I was doing a weekly Torah talk show with, he was there at the hospital. Like he he picked me up. He he gave me a ride home. I mean, in in almost you know all the all the forms that you fill out at a doctor's office or at at a new job, they often want an emergency contact, right? needing to come up with a name and a phone number for an emergency contact can be a very rude part of reality if if you lack that do do friend, friends hang out with you outside a synagogue sure they hang out with you inside a synagogue they dance with you they sing with you they they pray next to you they study torah with you they eat with you they drink with you they set you up so one of the great things about Orthodox Judaism is the way it connects you with other people. And so I know many people in the chat say, oh, you're not fully accepted. You're, you're forever the stranger. Well, they ask me to you know, take their kids to school if they need that. They entrust me with various volunteering uh, responsibilities, which have significance for the community. They're not just like sweeping, sweeping the floor. They set me up on dates, not just dates with other converts, but dates, you know, matches, shadukim, with women who, who are born Jewish. I, I remember there's this Israeli guy, he set me up with his ex-wife. Then, then uh, unfortunately, I started talking about my first book that I wrote, History of X, 100 Years of Sex in Film. And uh, I think that was pretty much the, the end of that. My ex-girlfriend called me the other day. Her boyfriend got put in jail for nine months, and now she wants to hang out. She's a hoe and an ex-stripper. I'm so righteous now, though, so I don't know what I would get from her. Yeah, gee, I have no idea what you would get from her. I remember I had a girlfriend. I'm not generally being known as, like, the most giving. And so she had the flu, and she was staying with her parents in Malibu. And she wanted me to drive up to Malibu to bring her some soup and crackers. And I said, can't you get someone else to do that? Like, there's this party I want to go to tonight and I have to work right now. And, and, and so she caught her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> and uh, she never forgot that. She never forgot that I was not there for her when she was sick. And I, I don't think she actually needed the soup and crackers. I think she wanted to see that I was the type of boyfriend who would bring her soup and crackers. And I was not the type of boyfriend who was going to rearrange my day to bring her soup and crackers. 
I share an office at work with my coworker. That seems like enough socializing because we talk half the day. <laughs> I broke my wrist at the motocross track, went home, slept, went to my doctor the next day with a bruised wrist. I had a manual car. I had to shift with my left hand. Sent me to get x-rays. Yeah, getting set up with friends is cool. I mean, I've gotten jobs from friends. I've gotten gigs from friends. I've had many wonderful opportunities and uh, invited to parties. Uh, I mean, friends friends make life so much better. Sean Hannity clip shows him in good form, which is rare. Okay, he's saying 40. Cut it out with all the, the personal meandering. Get back to the Torah. In other, what he's saying is that if you can imagine a time where everyone would disappear, or, and this is the important thing, the rest of society would adopt monotheism, then the ceremonial law is no longer binding. For then the condition for this law, namely Israel's relationship to pagan peoples, would have ceased, and this law would sink into complete insignificance. And as whole time and others will then explain, we are now living in such an era. We are living in Germany. We're living in Europe where everyone is a monotheist. And in the Arab world, they're also monotheists. He's touching on something here. Even atheists are effectively monotheists because everyone believes in right and wrong, right? When you tell anyone that's unfair, nobody says there's no such thing as unfairness. When, when you say that's right, that's wrong, that's evil, that's good, nobody ever says there's no such thing as good, All right? People think that history has meaning and a purpose and, and direction, and that there's objective good and evil. So practically, virtually everyone lives like a monotheist. Theist. So all these special laws that are designed to keep us separate from the non-Jews are no longer applicable because they are no longer barbarians and they're no longer polytheists. They're not pagans. They're not idolaters. They're monotheists, even though they have a different uh, perspective on it. They're monotheists. And then if you would say to them, well, what about the people living in these far islands? That, that's not relevant. We don't live among them. The people we live among are monotheists, they're moral people, and therefore we don't need to be separated from them through the ceremonial law. The only okay, so this is the perspective of the more modern forms of Judaism, which are compromises with the tradition. It's a lot harder to get excited and passionate about a compromise. So that's why the most passionate Jews, the most devoted Jews, the Jews who do most things in Jewish life, who devote themselves most to the Jewish people, to the Jewish state, to Jewish learning, all right, tend to be Orthodox Jews. So there is a level of camaraderie and connection and, and commitment to each other. There is a, a bond in Orthodox Judaism. There is a sense of community, right? And, and with that, that connection with other people, that getting on the same page with other people, that getting into synchronicity with other people, that creating a shared reality with other people creates an energy that's just not easily available elsewhere, right? I think the primary source of energy is other people. So why do we need friends? Because they are the motor for energy, right? It's really hard to be energized if you're not connected with other people. It's really hard to be enthusiastic if you're not connected with other people. All right, I like to spend a lot of my spare time reading books, but unless I had the opportunity to talk about those books with other people, I wouldn't have the energy and the drive and the passion and the enthusiasm to wake up at 4 a.m. sometimes to tackle Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, a book written in 1651. But because I have the opportunity to talk about that book with my friends, I have the, the power and the energy to do that. I, I get up in the morning and I do all these challenging things. I, I take a cold shower. I, I do these challenging exercises. I get myself outside to, to go for a walk. I talk to sponsees. I, I get on 12-step phone meetings. I, I do a lot of things that don't come naturally to me in the morning, but I get the energy to do them because I talk about them with other people and with people who find them significant and interesting and we connect on this shared version of reality that we create together. And then from that shared reality comes a bond and with every human bond that you form comes an ethic. That's it. Bye-bye.